Hi, Mikko. Good morning. Good morning, Jamie. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Good, good. Greetings both... from uh, very chilly California. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's almost dark now in London, even though it's only just gone four o'clock. But we both have coffee, so I think, I think we'll be yes, okay. Yes, we do. We do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for making the time to join this uh, sentientist conversation. And yep. I know you've watched a few of the previous conversations and we've chatted a little bit on Twitter and via email as well. So it's great to get the chance to talk to you as close as we'll get to face to face. So uh, the idea of these conversations is really to try and focus on the two deepest philosophical questions, to my mind, at least. What's real? Uh, what should we believe in? And what matters morally? What should mm -hmm. we have compassion for? What should we care about? Yep. And some people like to keep those two topics very separate, but I quite like linking the two together. And so to get back to, uh, yeah, if, if you wouldn't mind for people who don't know you to just do a brief introduction to your life and your work sure. and your focus. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. My name is, to give the full Finnish pronunciation, but I go by Miko. I have mostly been a in the business of technology for my career. My first job out of college was with Google over here in California in Mountain View. And I've since lived in the UK for, in the UK or the US most of my life, working in technology, both with Google, with startups, with consulting as an investor. And I'm originally from Finland. I grew up in, in a small town close to the eastern border, close to Russia. And I grew up in a political family. My, my dad was a long-term, long-time career MP. And we also had, had a bit of a hobby farm on the, in the, in, in where we lived, we kept sheep and, and, and ducks sometimes and experience with those animals, uh, has informed my, my thinking throughout my life. And I'm, I'm I'll, I'll go, go back to that as we discuss these things, but more recently, and I think more relevantly for this discussion as well, I founded a nonprofit, the nonprofit organization, Sentient Media. Obviously the, you know, the name is, is a nod towards the topics that we're talking about now. And the, the mission of Sentient Media is to increase media awareness and media and discuss media coverage of topics related to especially farmed animals. Yeah. That is the area that I believe is most neglected at the moment when it comes to sentient suffering. And uh, yeah, that was at a time when I had, uh, I had sold a company that I was uh, a CEO for, for three to four years. And uh, I saw the moment to do something good and, and give back to, to the cause that I, I care about. And I asked around and learned that this kind of a, a focus, this kind of a, a organization with this mission, this focus would be useful in the movement, in the farmed animal rights and farmed animal welfare movement. And, and that was a really good fit. I think I'd worked with media or media related companies throughout my life. And I went back to, I've got a, I've got an undergrad in, in business, but I went back to graduate school to do a, a master's in philosophy of social sciences at the LSE and uh, which was a, a, an awesomely challenging <laughs> experience having dabbled in philosophy informally until then, and then going through the, the rigor of academic philosophy. But I did go back to school to, to look into those things, especially because of this interest for sentientism, although I did not know that term at that point. But yeah, focused very much on evolution and morality in, in, in those studies. It's been a, a, a weird meandering path. In retrospect, everything makes sense. In retrospect, all like life narratives. Yeah, you can are, construct are, a story yeah. after the fact. Yeah, they're they're good constructs in retrospect, but yeah, that's how that's where how we're here now. Yeah, great, thank you. And it would be good to wind the clock back a little bit to you, I guess, how you grew up in Finland when we're answering that first question of what's real. So for many people, that's a story about growing up either in a religious or a household that was already naturalistic or atheistic, and how people's epistemology and thoughts about that sort of worldview have developed over time. It'd be interesting to know that story. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty hard for me to characterize the the religious or non-religious influences in my childhood. The a, a country like Finland that has a state church, 
Mm. The Lutheran church is the state church, is the official religion, the default mode. If you're born into the country and they don't know on what label to give you, at least you get that. Yeah. It depends on your family, of course. Um, but we were never, my family was never religious in a big way. We, as, as children, we were certainly taught to recite nighttime prayers and, and, and so forth, probably due to my paternal grandparents, really. To balance that off, interestingly, my, my mother's father, so my maternal grandfather, was um, a former science teacher. And, and he, had, he lived close by and he had awesome literature on the evolution of life and uh, natural history of the world and astronomy, especially. Mm. He had a cool telescope and so forth. So that, I think, was part of a little bit of an influence as well. And I learned, I've always found religions very interesting and very fascinating. Going with the state church idea set up, everyone, all, every kid gets essentially religious education in school, unless your family opts you out of that, Yeah, which was very rare when I was growing up, that anybody would have, would have opted out from religious education. I always scored uh, perfect marks for those classes since, since being six all the way until high school, because the stories are pretty engaging. There's, you know, there are adventure stories sometimes and, uh, and moral dilemmas at other times. And I learned to read with Dungeons and Dragons manuals. Oh, really? So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. It was as simple as uh, having passed by, I think, Finland's first role-playing game store in Helsinki and seeing like this red box with this fierce dragon in the, in yeah. the front, which is, if you're a, a role-playing game nerd, you might recognize that as the first Dungeons and Dragons boxed set. And I just told my mom, I want that. I don't know what it is. I want that. And that's how that started. Um, so yeah, I've, I've always been fascinated by, the, by, by religions, religions and how they define, define people's thinking, pe define individuals, if you mm. will, but not so much the organized religion. The, my, my opposition to organized religion really happened at the, you know, the puberty, intellectual awakening kind yeah. of level. And I, I resigned from the church as and I is that, to do that, when is I that, was 18. Is, is that a formal process you, you go through? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's even a cooling off period. Hmm. You know, just in case you find God in the next three months or so, <laughs> yeah, a message comes hit, through. Hit, hit your head and want to want to make sure that want to play Pascal's wager and and make sure that you have that ticket to heaven just in case you somebody were yeah. to ask for one. Was that a difficult process to go through? Did it feel strange or a relief or? Awkward? It was a relief. No, it was yeah. a relief. It was not awkward. It was. It's 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 a rite of passage in a way as well. It, you get your driver's license and you quit the church. Yeah, take the training wheels off and yes, <laughs> off you go. It sounds like it was a process of, I guess, yeah, personal independence and that classic teenage thing of thinking for yourself sure. and thinking things through. And I went through a very similar process of just looking at the evidence and looking at the inconsistencies and just thinking this doesn't make sense. And also learning about many different religions and putting them in a historical context. And it just seemed very clear to me that they were human inventions that had some really interesting common themes and some good elements to them. But it, the epistemology and the facts just didn't hang together for me. But for other people, there's also a degree of seeing some of the difficult ethics that can come through religious thinking as well. And I've spoken to people who were really confronted by either homophobia or sexism or caste discrimination or something like that coming from a religious or a traditional culture and that being, you know, I guess, a trigger for them moving away from a religious view. Was it more the former for you, the sort of evidence and thinking things through, or were there ethical angles to your resignation as well? Yeah, it was a bit of both. It was a bit of both. When it comes to the, the evidential side of evidence and the really the epistemology of religion, I think I was uh, like no 16 year old should be reading Nietzsche, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my first, the first exposure to philosophy. And the first thing to go out is, uh, is religion, at least organized religion. And so that was 
certainly that was part of it, but also a part of it was relativism in the sense that it was, when I say I was fascinated by religions, I, I, I could say that I tried on different religions, not so much because of the, the, the form or because of what they promised, but more to feel like, what would it feel like to believe in this kind of thing? Like, yeah. what would it feel like to believe in, in, in polytheism or what would it feel like to believe in, you know, the old Viking gods or stuff like that? Uh, what would it feel like to believe in the devil instead of God? Um, and by trying on those things, and it might be like some kind of a link to like the role-playing game thing of like trying on different, you know, mm. characters and, and, and different uh, worldviews in a way that that also informed m- me of the, of the relative merits and lack thereof of these different worldviews and that nothing explained the world any better than something else. And you might as well just make any of them up as you go. Why not believe in the gods of the Middle Earth, J.R.R. Tolkien stuff? And, and that kind of comparative religion, if you will, done in that kind of an experiential way was also, I think, important. So it didn't, it wasn't as much as a, it wasn't like a rebellion against this, uh, this system or this oppressive worldview. Although I saw the elements of that as well. It was more of a, more of a realization of like, this is all very interesting, but it's not very different from picking your favorite sports team and rooting for them no matter what. Yeah, it's somewhat arbitrary. Yeah, yeah very. Mm. Yeah, interesting. And and it sounds like the, I guess, your way of thinking about morals and ethics were never particularly bound to that religious worldview. For some people, it's foundational. You know, their ethics are defined by the tenets of the religion and by the judgment of a deity that is almost by definition a perfect instantiation of good that you can measure yourself against, although that often seems to be quite tricky given the mysterious ways these deities and their emissaries seem to move. Um, But that's one interesting challenge for many people who move away from a religious worldview is they can sometimes struggle to ground their morality. They're worried they've lost some grounding for their morality. And that doesn't sound like that's something you've ever struggled with. So it would be interesting to go on to the second question about what matters morally. And again, Mm -hmm. to think about how you've gone on that journey through your life, both in terms of, I guess, a moral system or ethical system or some form of grounding, if there is one, but also how your moral considerability shifted over time as well. And you've hinted at that already in terms of uh, your work with sentient media and thinking about sentient non-humans. But uh, it'd be interesting to know how you went through that journey and where you've got to now about what what matters for you. Yeah, I had a I had this idea pretty early on and I did not substantiate it in any way until much later um, that m- moral intuitions, moral feelings, mm. the sensation of disgust and, and, and so forth are in a way a sixth sense that they are they are our, our, our social sense that we just like we've learned to eat the red fruit and, and not the green fruit, we've learned to avoid this type of social behavior and prefer another type of social behavior because it's good for us. So that, that's a very, that is obviously a very, in a way, naturalistic way of, of looking at morality, or at least, at least the starting point Mm -hmm. of of thinking of morality. But then I did struggle with, with, it's not struggle. It's not like abandoning religion somehow eroded my (laughs) <laughs> my trust in human morality or, or ethical systems, but it was more of a, a start for search for of ethical systems and the axiology that we construct for making sense of the world. Mm-hmm. But importantly, I think it was always like I, I pretty early on realized that morality is has something to do with the social world like you don't morality in a, a solipsist does yeah. not have or need morality and i think it started from there so this is like a very weird thing and i think maybe it may be that memory is betrays me and memory is very faulty but i have a very vivid recollection of of being around like 10 and thinking that 
and having this like complete solipsistic realization that the entire world could be just constructed for me and my experience. I have no proof of external experience, external beings or, or mental states and so forth. When I turn my back, how do I know that the world exists there still? Is it just being procedurally generated? <laughs> procedurally generated, maybe. I don't know if that was, I didn't have anything. I remember just being like, being young enough to be com- pretty overwhelmed by that thought yeah. and also realizing that it's, it can't be true. It's, you know, can't be true. But that was, I think that may have been like a, like a triggering event into thinking thinking about morality in such a high theoretical construct already at yeah. a young age. I'm not saying that I thought I thought of that stuff that I didn't think think about when I was 10. That was more like, you know, high school level thinking of, of morality as a social sense. And that's quite a mind-blowing thought, even for an adult to have. So for a 10-year-old, that's... Yeah. Uh... <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I was 10, but I remember yeah, being yeah. like, it was it was back in like, you know, grade school, lower. Yeah. Um, so yeah, back to your question of, of whether, whether, yeah, whether I struggled with, with finding a grounding for morality or ethics um, and how I think of that, that today. I, I looked at, I think I found... The first home in in ethics I found in utilitarianism. Mm. I was it is a it's a very appealing system. In if you try to position situate utilitarianism into the the broader uh, context in 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 where we exist and when we're our, where we study our ethical systems. It's one that that goes well with the tendency to measure everything. It goes well with with probabilistic thinking, and it's also very Western in that it is very indi- individualistic. It relies on, I think, methodological individualism by necessity. Although I'm I certainly I'm ready to be shut down on that point, but it's also it's, it's also Western in the sense that it assumes the rational individual. And uh, that by empowering a rational individual with the tools of thinking, we will achieve better ethical outcomes. Yeah. And, and even under a utilitarian perspective, there's still a decision about what utility is and sure. what types of entities it, it might even reside in as well. And, and the way I've tried to frame sentientism is actually to be neutral about the ethical or moral system, whether it's... You know, deontological rules or virtue ethics or utilitarian you can work out any method of making trade-offs and deciding what's good you like as long as you include all sentient beings in your moral consideration as you work that out so irritatingly that sort of framing of sentientism is annoyingly neutral on you know almost everything yeah. else um but even under ut- utilitarian view it's interesting because quite a few of the early utilitarians were quite explicit that it wasn't just about humans they talked quite openly about non-human sentience and I guess their grounding for many of them was that utility really is defined in terms of quality of sentient experience so suffering and flourishing Mm -hmm. Um, is that framing of utility linked to sentience that you identify with and it would also be interesting to know how your moral circle if it is a circle has evolved over time as well because you mentioned growing up around non-human animals at a young age too Yes, yes. They're absolutely linked. They're absolutely linked in my experience and in my worldview of sentientism as well. The, yeah, so growing up in a small town that had like a couple of big industries as the major employers and growing up in a family that was prominent in one way or another, the dad being a member of the parliament that yeah. makes you makes you in makes you a celebrity of some sorts in within, You're within in the, the public town. eye 50, in some way mm-hmm. 50,000 people exactly yeah and you combine that with a little uh, some I- introversion my my f- best friends as a kid were the sheep yeah. and yeah. we we also we had to take care of them on a daily basis especially over winters when they you know stay indoors in their in their little sheep house and and rely on fresh water and and grains and and hay and so forth so the the interaction with these animals was constant and i also learned i was i remember being surprised by by learning that sheep are characterized 
uh, by their sheepishness, right? Like that they yeah. are, you know, like skittish and scared and easily, yeah, freaked out. Whereas my experience was different in that, like once they accept you as part of the herd, uh, it's a very, it's a very different experience. You start to understand how they communicate uh, amongst each other and and what their wants are and what their needs are. Um, in, in a way, what their experience of the world is. Yeah. And and that was. And now this is in the context of, of this being a hobby farm. So us keeping any herd of sheep for, or any individual sheep at a maximum of four or five years, mm. but with, with slaughter being an almost annual occurrence, I think was a very difficult, um, and thought provoking setting to grow up in where you had named and knew and watched them grow these animals that, that were then slaughtered and, and maybe even served as food yeah. in your own home. Although that was always a taboo topic. I remember once asking like, who are we eating? Like literally at the table. And that was not well received as a question. Wow. Yeah. So I, and I, I first went, I tried to deal with this in different ways. I first went vegetarian when I was 15, 16. And since then, I have been an on and off vegetarian, vegetarian more or less for the last 12 or 12 years or so, uh, vegan for the last seven-ish years, maybe mm. six years at least, with like episodes of veganism throughout my life before that but but having having i had to construct these kinds of justifications for like why would i eat why would i eat meat why would i consume like dairy products and so forth and at, at some point i remember thinking that wanting to believe that chicken for instance were essentially bio automata biological robot robots with without experiences and wiring and for that but that of course is totally wrong birds are very sentient highly social many are are intelligent in in ways that we don't even understand very well so i'm ashamed shame to have held those opinions um but yeah it was you do I do have this experience of having to build these justifications for yeah. my own uh, moral behavior or rather for my own behavior in these conflicting ideas of morality. A common justification for carnism is some kind of human supremacy, yeah. which I certainly tried on <laughs> yeah. once or twice. And that can um, be naturalistic or religiously motivated. You can have yeah, the dominion yeah, yeah. Or made in God's image, but you could also have a naturalistic approach that just says we're the cleverest, we're the most sentient, we're the most intelligent, we're the apex of some biological tree. So it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Although then you're yeah, you're committing a, a naturalistic fallacy there, <laughs> though, mm. uh, assigning equivalence between moral properties and natural properties. Yeah. Yeah, it's I navigated my way into this, into real into the final realization of like like sentience is undeniable suffering is undeniable we ha have not only a priori but we have plenty and plenty of evidence yeah. of other of non-human animals experiencing things experiencing suffering and so forth so that was certainly the the end of that yeah <laughs> that it's search a yeah it's a fascinating path you've been through because i think with some people clearly have a sort of supernatural or a religious worldview that defines mm -hmm. a sort of ethical standard that they follow. Other people, when they don't have that, will abandon morality completely and go down a sort of nihilistic approach of nothing nothing matters. Others will take it to a, a different form of arbitrariness, a sort of extreme relativism where it's just there is no real moral good or bad. It's just what we are able to negotiate amongst ourselves. And while that can seem that's often well-motivated, we know where that can lead. It can lead to arbitrary classification or categorization of groups including humans as the other and yes. that excuses you know some awful things that we've seen through history and still see today so that's partly what's drawn i think you and me back to this linking of 
epistemology and ethics in that our morality and seeing the moral salience of sentience is grounded in a naturalistic scientific understanding of what sentience is and what beings are likely to be sentient. And we still need humility around that assessment and that judgment. We need to be prudent. No one's claiming we have perfect knowledge about the nature of sentience or consciousness or whether a muscle is sentient or a sea cucumber is. Or, but, but it still seems like a very solid naturalistic grounding for a almost tautologically true <laughs> ethics. And I, I get nervous sometimes that it almost does seem too straightforward but at the same time most people on the planet have a different worldview they value things differently they will exclude some humans often from Mm. their moral circle and for the vast majority of people around the world they will exclude at least some non-human sentient animals whether it's the non-charismatic wild animals or certainly farmed animals so while it seems tautologically true that all suffering should matter and we shouldn't Mm. needlessly cause harm most people's actions are very different and and, the part you described I think was fascinating because I don't have a naive view about the sort of blank slate ethical human that without social norms would be some sort of pure and perfect ethical being I think that's bullshit we're just evolved beings with predilections and drives and ways of thinking that really evolved and they didn't evolve to be good they evolved to help us procreate and continue as patterns. So just because something, as you said, is natural or evolved that way, doesn't mean it's intrinsically good. But I do think that as you were as a child, if you actually spend time with non-human sentience, like the sheep that were your friends, it's quite natural to be able to identify with the perspective of that other being and to think from their perspective. It's always imperfect. It's imperfect between humans. I can you know, never really truly understand your perspective, but I can understand enough to have empathy for it and have compassion for your suffering. It's never going to quite feel the same way as my suffering. But I think young children find it reasonably easy to do that, certainly with the more mammalian uh, non-human species as well. But then almost from birth, society teaches us that it's Uh, normal and acceptable and even sometimes required to cause harm and death to those non-human sentience for food and drink and and clothing and so on and the the power of that those social norms is Mm. extremely strong and I think that's why it was interesting how you described that process of you started out identifying with the sheep and seeing them as morally salient the society's message was it's normal to have them killed and and then to eat them and then the painful process you went through of having to then construct rationalizations for yeah why you were doing what you'd been told was normal and that's remarkably common and i think it's that's one of the themes that plays through a lot of the conversations we've had is that in a sense once you've come to this realization about the moral centrality of sentience and the fact there doesn't seem to be a better way of understanding the world than a naturalistic approach whereby you engage with reality and test your beliefs about it and have hold them provisionally and probabilistically and with some prudence once you get to that point it does almost feel tautological and it's hard to understand why most of the rest of the people on the planet disagree so it's almost as if the the philosophical argument it, it is one but most of the rest of the people on the planet are working through that process of rationalizing traditional or social or religious beliefs that contravene what almost seems like tautologically logical. So I'm rambling on a bit, but it it, it brings me back to one of the themes that I know has been central to your work, which is on the one hand, there's the force of moral argument and logical philosophical reasoning. And that's an interesting and fascinating space. And that will continue to fight forever over all sorts of trolley problems and deep and tractable trade-offs. But it does seem to me like the really basic, obvious stuff is the answers are pretty obvious for the most important questions there around the centrality of sentience. So in a way, the bigger problem when we're trying to make the world a better place is less about the force of moral argument. It's really about social norms and social change and behavior patterns and beliefs. So it would be quite interesting to come on to a section where we talk about how you see the future evolving in that context. And I'd like to try and set a sort of optimistic cast here of saying, look, if we assume that we could persuade you know, 8 billion people to take a more naturalistic approach to understanding the world and had a broader moral circle Hmm. that at least included all sentient beings without those arbitrary classifications and exclusions. Um, I took a a quick extra sip of coffee once you implied that optimism is required. (laughs) You might need another sip. And and you don't need to be optimistic either. You can go either way. But I guess the, the question is, how do you see the future evolving? How could it evolve? And how can we... Yeah. 
push it in what yeah. you and I see as positive directions. Yeah, let me take a couple of steps back and, and, and preface that by going back to my personal story and noting that what I, my, my narrative was a very Western and individualistic narrative. Yeah. I spoke of my own rationalizations. I spoke of the influences having been immediate family. And I neglected to mention for whatever reason, any social or cultural factors that would be, that could be driving that kind of behavior mm. um, and those kinds of attitude changes. And I also presented it in, in a very rationalistic sense yeah. in that um, I told a story of, of thinking about things, arriving at a conclusion and there, and, and changing my attitudes based on evidence and therefore changing my behavior. Yeah. That doesn't seem to be the case. Rationalism is in itself not a value-free uh, worldview. Yeah, let's let's yeah. put it, it's called the worldview. We have evolved to be rational, not in order to get to the truth, but in order to win arguments, in order to persuade and influence others in our immediate social sphere for status or survival advantage. And we have evolved to be coherently rational in order to maintain our own personal narratives in the face of faulty memories and yeah. you know, verbalizations for our behavior and instincts and so forth. So with that said, I don't know if it's uh, I don't know if we should be shocked in any way to see that just because we can rationally prove X, most people won't be persuaded by that. Yeah. Um, and I think it's been really fascinating to see in in recent experimental psychology and experimental philosophy as well how the received wisdom of behavior stemming from attitudes like I behave this way because I believe this and this has actually been turned on its head in many yeah. cases where people find and easy examples are are from the extremely polarized uh, political worldviews where when presented with evidence whether it supports or contradicts your view it strengthens your attitude in yeah. that direction. Either way. In, in the direction you already hold. Yeah. yeah you yeah. just dig in your heels more. Regardless of whether it is supporting or uh, or refuting your position. Yeah. It has the same effect within a range of range of small differences, but significantly in, in that direction in both cases. And similarly, we we find we find attitudes and worldviews that fit our behavior. Yeah. So yeah. if I grow up in in um, a social setting where religion is the norm, where I'm taking to church every Sunday and interact with the congregation and so forth, I assume the religious worldview because that fits my existing behavior and my existing yeah. life. Yeah. The it's rare for people to. And very understandably, it, it is, it's rare and difficult for people to break with those social norms just because of their internal rationalizations. Yeah. Yeah. It, it often takes some kind of, some kind of external pressure or inciting incident or something like that, that, that then shoves you on that path. We have a, I think we have a significant minority of, of, I don't know what the latest like psychological term or label for for the type of person who you know likes to go against the grain and is, is more explore exploratory takes more risks and, and so forth like those people seem to exist in populations all over the world and it is easier for that personality type i don't know the science behind that i'm totally just hand waving and gesturing here it seems to be easier for that personality type to go against them yeah against the social norms so in that sense the when when we, I guess, from a humanist, sentientist, anti-carnist 
I'm trying to avoid the word vegan because it's, it, it ha- comes with it with a lot of baggage that we can go into in a second. Yeah. When we look at the world, it's difficult to see how it makes sense because it doesn't seem to. But at the same time, we should also realize that sense making has traditionally been a very bad indicator uh, of how things really are. It didn't really make sense that the world, that the earth is round until we had solid evidence or not even evidence, but experience of it. It wasn't the evidence, it was the experience. It didn't make sense that, that the, that the earth would revolve around the sun because it just doesn't seem that way. It didn't make sense that, that humans would be related to other non-human animals through their historical evolution and so forth. And I can continue that yeah, yeah. Uh, until the present day. So common sense has never been a good predictor of, of the world. But so with that said, I think, uh, and there's, I think there's already too much to unpack here soon, but the assumption that we will win because we're rational might be, it might be a dangerous one. How do you feel about that? I agree. I think there's, um, there's a naivety about it that just discounts the, the sheer weight of so pressure of social norms. And I think there's also sometimes a lack of humility about a naturalistic or a scientific worldview that at least in tone, and I think you could argue that you could might find this in a sort of scientific worldview. You quite often find it in the atheist or the skeptic free thinking community. And you certainly find it in the animal advocacy in the vegan community where there's a sense of, we've got all the answers, we are correct. And that's the end of the discussion. And even if those people are correct, it doesn't help you persuade or drive change or bring people on board. And there is also danger that you are actually wrong, that you've been trapped in some form of your own dogma. So I do think in all of those movements and in a naturalistic worldview generally, we constantly need to remind ourselves that the essence of a naturalistic worldview is not confidence in fact given evidence it's a radical open-mindedness it's a probabilistic set of beliefs outside of formal systems we should never be 100 percent confident of anything and we might be 99.9 percent, but we should should always leave enough healthy doubt to be open to new evidence otherwise we'd become trapped in our own dogma so i think a healthy injection of you know genuine deep humility is required in in all of those fields and endeavors and it's not always present certainly in the tone of conversation and i think the other thing that will happen is to twin it with a genuine compassion. Yeah. And uh, it's very easy to have compassion for you know people that agree with you, but that's not the challenge of compassion. The challenge of compassion is to have a universal compassion, even for entities that you might not identify with emotionally or and people you disagree with on Twitter, right? You, <laughs> even mm-hmm. then, even people you have deep disagreements with, you need to have enough compassion to still listen, to still engage, partly because you might learn something, yeah, um, but part of it, you're much, I, my, my you're much more just, likely to be able to persuade yes. persuade people of, of the way you're thinking if you can yes. reach out and understand. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I stopped disagreeing with people on Twitter. I just agree with everything on Twitter these days. <laughs> it's much easier that way. Yeah, the, I saw uh, an interesting yeah, no, post recently where someone someone uh, tweeted, "Just to be safe, I I would like to disown all of you for all of your opinions about everything." And that was just that's, just to be safe. Yeah. Everybody's written yeah. off. Yeah, blanket disapproval. Yeah, yeah. I think that, yeah, that those are very good points. The, it breaks my heart often reading news, especially in the political sphere, yeah. when so, that, that someone has changed their opinion, that it's, and it's somehow seen as a bad thing. You know, yeah. I changed my opinion about this. Uh, or we dig up things that people said 10, 15 years ago, and they say one thing, and now these days they, they say another thing, because they have looked into things and updated their beliefs based on their experience and evidence. The term turncoat has like yeah. massive negative connotations and it shouldn't like it's it should uh, be a mark of pride. It should be rewarded. I, exactly. Socially. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Not the, the, yeah. Deeply held beliefs are like every time there's a deeply held belief, just alarm bells should go off. It's yes. Like that's okay. Is, is that because of, of dogmatism? Is that because of, of having to identify with a certain social group mm-hmm. or is it just intellectual laziness? Yeah. And when I spoke to AJ Jacobs, he, I like the way he put it. He said, we should have shallow beliefs, not deep, deeply held beliefs. Right. Yeah. No, I, I uh, somebody said, uh, strong convictions, lightly held. 
yeah. also. Yeah. I yeah. think that's that 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 goes well with the, with the probabilistic worldview as well. Like we are fairly confident in matters being this way. We don't have evidence to the contrary, at least, even if we don't have full evidence to to prove that things are exactly this way. So, but within with with the in face of of this evidence, this is the most likely way we should be we should be acting and we should be assuming the world is. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, updating your beliefs uh, in a naturalistic, em, 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 it's, it is empiricism, isn't yeah. it? It also applies to, to rationalism, but especially when it comes to, when it comes to evidence. And evidence can also be, you know, just expanding your horizons, expanding your worldviews. Yeah, and I think that's part of the reason why I like to describe it as evidence and reason rather than science, because there are many different types of evidence. It's not just randomized control trials or yeah. lab experiments or running something at CERN, right? Evidence can include my own personal lived experience. Now, yeah. it, it makes sense to be somewhat skeptical of that and to want to corroborate and to check and use other sources of evidence. But evidence can be quite a wide term, and I think it should be. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes there's too narrow a definition of the, the term evidence, which, again, I think can be sometimes unhelpful. Yeah, and, and evidence is, is, is contextual. It, it depends on what we're what we are trying to prove or disprove and yeah across different sciences we have different criteria for evidence and accepting or not accepting evidence but yeah we but i think this is part of the the potentially lofty ambitions and in a way intellectually elitist perception of this very rationalist thought um that i think we should also be ready to abandon or at least understand people who don't want to assume that is the way they should think or yeah. the way they should experience the world. And I think that's also like for any kind of advocacy, uh, that's crucial to keep in mind is that it's not just that the, the people you're trying to influence may not agree with your argument. They may not recognize the form of the argument yeah. at all as valid. Yeah. yeah. I agree. And I think the part of the trick is to have a radical open-mindedness, but to also be comfortable not knowing things and just saying, yes. look, I, I don't know, we're uncertain, and to be comfortable in that position and go and try and find out. Whereas some people, I think, are radically open-minded and then are willing to ascribe belief to things or confidence in things before the evidence is really there. So I think that's mm. one way of staying radically open-minded, but don't commit until there is evidence. But I agree. I think that open-mindedness needs to come you know, through the way we drive advocacy, partly because we need to be open-minded because we might be wrong, so we need to keep learning, but also because of that compassion, because you need to understand that different people have different perspectives, different histories, different backgrounds, different contexts, different objectives, and without listening and engaging in constructive conversation with compassion, yeah, I think you'll be less useful, but you're also, I think, less moral in the way you're pursuing your advocacy. Yeah, interesting that less less useful and what do you mean by that, actually? What, what I, I mean, mean by it is, I think, I think ethically, it's better to engage constructively in a conversation with compassion and with right. open-mindedness, just because we should have compassion for, you know, the sentient beings we're conversing with. But I think it's more useful in that, in the sense that you're more likely to have a productive conversation where the other person appreciates your perspective as you appreciate theirs. So mm -hmm. even just from a perspective of thinking about the effectiveness of advocacy if we want to end animal farming or we want to reduce inequality or we want to uh, address some human discrimination right if those are our objectives in advocacy quite often the advocacy is more effective if, it, if it's done it can still be firm and clear but if it's done yeah. with compassion with openness so i think yeah. there is a there's a link between doing the right thing in your advocacy but also its effectiveness to a degree that might be mm -hmm. naive mm -hmm. naively optimistic but yeah, yeah, I, I I hear that, and I I think I agree with I think I agree with most of that. Although it's I think we could could consider a couple of practical examples mm. um, of this. So one thing that comes to mind when it comes to advocacy for animals, so advocacy for for sentient beings, is that we discussed already the individual centric versus mm a socio-centric approach to explaining why we 
behave the way we do and and, and how we how we find the justifications for that so the because I might be wrong, but I think this is something where, especially the Western advocacy for animals, and I, when I say animals, like in, in general, like I, any, anything from animal welfare to animal rights, to yeah. dietary change, to like hybrid forms, reducitarianism, flexitarianism, so forth. We have the, we've placed the onus on the individual. Yeah. We have, it's, um, that's why we, consumer choices, exactly. That's, that's a little bit, why we it's not a little bit but i think that's the main reason why veganism comes with such a baggage is that it it shifts the responsibility entirely to the end individual and it it places blame and uh, trying to convert people to veganism especially in the context of food where it is the most relevant is a bit like standing on the side of the freeway with a sign telling people to switch from cars to bicycles because cars are polluting the planet. Yeah. It is, it's like, maybe some people will like at least think of, think about that maybe as an option, but it's the wrong context for that argument. And it will, yeah, annoy the drivers quite a bit. And And it's also an impossible request in many cases, because I want to bring the, a systemic nature of animal exploitation into the picture here. And that's why I used the example of a freeway, because we have this system of individual logistics and transport and commuting and so forth. So it's very difficult for an individual to, or, or rather it's quite unfair to go in and blame the individuals for having to participate mm-hmm. in that kind of a system. And I think that's a, a, a more of a crutch than a lever when it comes to delivering the the animal rights message through veganism. Yeah. It can be difficult because it's very difficult. It's very hard emotionally to condemn a system that you are part of already because, and as you to the earlier conversation, the people who can do that because of independent thought or working something true for themselves, it's pretty rare that those, those individuals do exist, but there aren't enough of them to drive the sort of change that we'd like to see. So it is hard. So what, what do you think are the, more productive levers to pull um, in driving that type of change and, and yeah. how optimistic are you that you know we will we'll see a positive change happen in that space yeah i do th- i do think that our best current the best current hypothesis seems to be incremental replacement of animal products with non-animal products relying on free market dynamics primarily so yeah making sure that plant-based foods are cheap tasty conveniently available i think i'm paraphrasing good food institutes material there increasing the social acceptance of alternatives yeah making Um, it feel more normal making it feel more normal but also yeah understanding what it what that normal means and also mm-hmm. like who defines normality in these contexts i think i should dig up the the source for this so so take it with a, with a grain of salt because i don't remember what exactly this was but i remember seeing research that that teenage or rather 12 to 16 year old females in families so that daughters mm-hmm. have a high proportionately highest level of influence when it comes to consumption and and dietary choices inside of those families. So, you know, maybe there are thought leaders and influencers like that, that we have not considered as, as primary stakeholders. The obviously marketing and advocacy towards children is, is a different that's, that comes with, it comes with with a lot of moral and legal, um, Uh, problems as it should but but then the yeah so I'm, I'm a reluctant champion of the market dynamics in this case the the fact that meat consumption is is still increasing yeah. and that it is being consolidated meaning that the the economies of scale make production cheaper it is still subsidized in practically all developed countries they all make these 
make it an uphill battle. Although at the same time, like we should be undoing those subsidies. We should be finding the political allies that we can work with mm. in order to, to achieve these things. Um, the mixed blessing of working with farmed animal issues is that it is very intersectional when it comes to causes. It is relevant for the climate impact. It's relevant for local environmental impact, yeah. for food justice in many cases, for labor justice in even more cases. <laughs> I didn't even mention individual health. Yeah, yeah. So there's there, there's a lot of ways, uh, a lot of different entry points into that discussion, which is also what we're trying to do with sentient media is find these different narratives that are pa parallel or at least tangential to the animal rights and animal welfare issues and use those to increase the awareness of these topics. But yeah, so finding like the, the political and, and cultural allies, I think is crucially important and avoiding, avoiding this, uh, this getting avoiding the stereotype of the cranky yeah. vegans. Yeah, those are some things that come to mind now, but it's, it is something that we do need a lot more research into mm -hmm. and a lot more experimentation with. And I think that's the ultimate measure of what we're trying to achieve, as you say, is those graphs of the number of sentient beings slaughtered every year. You know, that's really the end point we're trying to uh, adjust. So while it might feel like, you know, veganism is becoming more widely accepted or it's you know more mainstream or we're making progress on that. And I think we are until those graphs tail off, you know, we're not really achieving the aims of the movement, however warm we might feel about messaging or culture or how things are shifting. So I, th I, th I think you're right. We've got to work in a way that recognizes, of course, there is individual accountability, but the real powerful levers are more institutional, whether it's policy and taxation and corporations and policy and law. And some are nervous about talking about the institutional side because they think we're letting the individual off what is still a moral choice that we can all make. And it actually, for many people in many cultures and many particularly people who live in somewhere like where you and I do it, it is actually trivially easy to make that choice. So I'm not saying that waiting for the institutional solutions is an excuse for the individual, but I think it is entirely fair to recognize where the real power and where the dynamics lie and to your point there are so many different intersecting agendas that all bear on this space and again only by being open-minded and engaging and constructive and can we build those sorts of coalitions and the other thing i'd say about the individual is that i think you're right there is this tone that our only role as an individual is as a consumer we decide whether to buy the the steak or we buy a plant-based alternative or a pot of hummus in the in this supermarket but that's not the only role of the individual because every one of the institutions we've talked about are driven by and governed and driven by individuals fine you can take an individual consumption choice but you can also vote you can also be a shareholder or a stakeholder or an employee or a manager or a leader or a you know stand for political office so there are so many different ways that individual activists can also pull on those institutional levers it's i think it should be an empowering message not one of there's nothing you can do or very little you can do as an individual. There's actually a great deal that every individual can do, but it's productive that those individuals are focused on pulling the institutional levers, not just thinking about individual consumption and blaming the individual consumer. Yeah, I, I agree with part of that. Um, I'll make a, a meta observation first, though. The first thing you mentioned was was about, yeah, looking at the, looking at the numbers of, of animals killed, slaughtered every year. I usually try and rephrase that in, in and 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 get away from talking about the killing because the killing is it's not the moral issue isn't with at least with for for myself the moral issue isn't with the killing it's with the giving birth into this system yeah. of perpetuated suffering right the death of a suffering animal is can be if done properly it can be euthanasia it's it's a release end to the end to the suffering and that's also i think that can also make it make some discussions a little more constructive if you frame it that way instead of the killing like we get really hung yeah. up on killing like yeah. because killing is, is such a moral act and uh and also it has a perpetrator somebody kills someone yeah whereas the producing more sentient beings into a system of suffering that's what i have a problem with yeah, that's Especially, where it starts like, right feeding the yeah. system in the first place yeah. yeah 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 there's this silly naive like uh, 
one of the dumbest argument against veganism probably is like it's like if we all went vegan overnight what would happen with all the yeah. all the animals we have over here like we're going to let them roam the streets or what yeah no like we like even if that was the case even if the if a miracle happened and everybody went vegan overnight like we would still probably have to euthanize like over 95 percent of the you know the animals that are in the system today but yeah so there's that rephrasing of the act yeah. of killing and to your point about individual responsibility in institutions, I do not want to deny the response, the moral responsibility of the individual, but I'd also like to still point out that it is, and I'm starting to come across as a bit of an anti-rationalist here, but it is, <laughs> it is a very methodologically individualistic view of institutional morality that we, that we find like leaders or influencers yeah, and yeah. so forth and assign the moral responsibility to them when they act in a, a social cultural institutional context that defines their behavior and as we as i pointed out a little while ago it is often that the behavior comes first and then they have to find the moral justification for that behavior later on if I took a job with, with a fossil fuel company now, I would have to find a justification for that. That would be like, okay, maybe this is the best point where I can influence things and create more sustainable sources of energy or nudge things in, in, in that way or, or, or that way. Um, so there is, yeah, we don't get very far if we start to doubt individual moral responsibility, let alone agency. But I, th I think it's going to be fruitful to keep in mind that that people are not, the human animal is not as individualistic yeah. or not as self-standing, especially when it comes to rationality and ethics than the Western conventional wisdom indicates. Yeah, no, I think that's a fair point. And even if, I th even if you, and I tend to, do this even if you do tend to focus back on the individual human or the individual sentient being as the agent you have to recognize the richness of all of the interdependencies and the relationships and the social constructs and the messaging and the, the influences even those individual behaviors so regardless of yeah. whether you think individually or societally the impact of society on the individual is overwhelmingly strong and i think that brings us back to some of the themes you talked about earlier on where you almost need to make it you make change socially easy and technically easy with alternatives first, because I think yeah. then people will change their actions before their before their ethics, and the, and the ethics will almost sort of catch up once it's easy to act in a different way. And I think there is a, there's almost a latent positive ethic that most people have. Most people think needlessly causing suffering to a sentient being is something they'd rather avoid. Most people in some of the surveys that the Sentience Institute have done show that even enormous numbers of people who still buy from factory farming think it's immoral and should be illegal. So there is a sort of latent ethics, I think, that if we can free it by making the alternatives easier and by making it societally, behaviorally easy, that we can tap into that ethic and change might mm -hmm. happen reasonably quickly. But yeah see. yeah the consumer research when it comes to attitudes and, and shopping behavior is notoriously um mismatched in that <laughs> that there's the, the causal connection just just doesn't seem to be there like yeah. i think if you'd if you really wanted to get to to understanding why people buy what they do you have to ask at the point of reaching into the cooler and and, and picking up the shrink wrapped carcass piece yeah the because we see the same thing with like healthy choices and so forth you ask people like do you do you buy healthy food would you like to buy more you know healthier food even if it's a little bit more expensive and yeah everybody says yes yes and then like in the cart nothing yeah so not quite nothing but it's a very weak yeah we yeah, as you say we're not as rational as we'd like to pretend yeah yeah we're not as rational as we as, as we'd like to pretend. It is it is a a, a useful and, and not entirely fictitious perspective to have of ourselves, certainly. Mm. Um, but yeah, remaining open to the fact that we might not be. We're I, I think it's it's fair to say that we're not fully rational. We it, it's hard to say how how we or imagine how we could be. I mean, our working <laughs> memory, for example, tends to be very short. It's very hard to compare more than three options in your mind at any given time and 
if that's the limit of your like cognitive bandwidth, how can you make sense of more complicated, let alone complex systems? So there's a little bit of that. And so we are, we're somewhere, we're, we're definitely a work in progress in many ways. When it comes to sentience, are we maximally sentient? Can there be beings that are more sentient than us? If there are beings that can have higher processing power cognitively and have more carefully, have more efficient sensor, sen- sensory mechanisms, for example, could that indicate that those beings would be more sentient? than the human animals, for example. Yeah, and, and my uh, different sentientists will disagree on this. They're radically diverse in their opinions about uh, almost everything. But my personal sense is that sentience is really just a class of advanced information processing that developed because it was evolutionarily useful to have an advanced model of the entity as a self in an environment. So in that context, if it's a class of information processing, it could be potentially unbounded and there may be forms of sentience or varieties of sentience that we can't even conceive of now and even within you know human experience people already experiment with that whether it's bioengineering or uh, meditation or drugs or other types of experiences Mm -hmm. that alter their own sentient experience so and arguably we're already hacking our own sentience through the use of day-to-day technology and that will only accelerate and increase so you know in, in principle i don't see why there's any reason why we should consider our current average human level of sentience as being any sort of apex or peak that can't be surpassed. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. There's uh, yeah, it's a, uh, I like that definition of, of sentience. Um, it assumes an evolutionary model of, 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 yeah, finding essentially a uh, reproductive advantage in that, that processing mm. power that you mentioned. There might be ways of, I think this could be, Maybe this is my flavor of sentientism, where I would, I define sentience from the viewpoint, from the starting point of empathy. Mm. And uh, because, so I'd like, and I'm still forming my opinion about this particular thing, but, and evolutionary psychology is full of just so stories. And, and they're very, these fables and fictions are, are very difficult to falsify or, or validate. But it seems to me completely possible that that we developed theories of other minds before we developed theories of our own minds. After all, it's I think it's it's more useful to assign possible hostile intent to some other agent in your vicinity than it is to assign intentions to your own yeah being your own mental states so we have this humans and some non-human animals as well have this kind of a folk theory of other minds so they can assume that uh, that other agents have plans and are are thinking ahead and and are weighing options and that Mm. kind of thing and uh, it it strikes me as that would be would would bestow more evolutionary benefits than than understanding yourself so again a little bit of an of an of an anti-individualistic maybe yeah. there's a, maybe there's <laughs> maybe there's a little bit of a yeah common thread here but i'd like to think that our understanding of our own individual minds and personalities has evolved as either as either to support or even as a side product of our understanding the other agents with with whom we we interact yeah i think that's a fascinating perspective again i think it's hard to imagine how uh sentience or consciousness could have evolved in an isolated entity that didn't that's have right. those types of societal or you know cooperative or threat dynamics with other entities too i'm yeah. very aware of the time it's been a fascinating conversation rico um we've covered i could talk for another couple of hours with you so thank you so much for taking the time to have that broad ranging conversation. I'm deeply appreciative of all you've done with sentient media, because I think you've played a really important role in helping shift some of these sort of societal norms and so on, and uh, and bringing in different partners of that coalition that will hopefully help with the win of addressing the challenges of animal farming as well. That's great to hear. 
Yeah, Thanks and um, I'm biased because you even published one of my articles as well quite a while ago. Yes. Yeah, on, yeah, on an integration <laughs> of human rights and animal rights into sentient yep. rights, hence the topic. So, yeah, thank you very much. What's the best way of people keeping up to date with you and following your work? And I'd like to point you to sentientmedia.org. Yeah, of course. Um, you'll find a, a little bit of my work there, but um, I'm an amplifier. So if I can help others amplify their voices and do good things in the world, that's what I... That's what I try to do. Yeah, please head over to Sentient Media. That's great. Thank you. Thanks so much for your work and thanks for the conversation. Thank you, Jamie. This was great.